Before I begin, I would like to acknowledge the Ngunnawal people and their ancestors as the traditional owners of the land on which we are meeting today and recognize their unique contribution to our environmental and cultural heritage, past, present, and future. I extend our respect to all indigenous people in attendance today. Well, welcome to the 2014 Infrastructure Forum, hosted by the Institute for Governance and Policy Analysis at the University of Canberra, Inside Canberra, and the AMP. The Prime Minister, Tony Abbott, has stated that he wants to be remembered as the Infrastructure Prime Minister. In fact, the 2014 budget has popularly been, become known as a tough budget. Some have said an austerity budget, but one that still invests more than ever in infrastructure. Moreover, Australia's legacy issue as host of the G20 is infrastructure. This forum aims to review and analyze the government's infrastructure policy, or at least um, our early thoughts on the government's infrastructure policy. Our discussion here will be organized around a keynote address from the Honorable Jamie Briggs MP, uh, Assistant Minister for Infrastructure and Regional Development and member for Mayo in South Australia. Commentators and experts alike recognize him as a smart and dynamic thinker and for Tony Abbott, a safe pair of hands for realizing the government's infrastructure agenda. I will invite Jamie up in a moment to address us, and then this will be followed by a number of short commentaries, one by myself on the importance of long-term thinking in infrastructure, one by Dr. Michael Jensen. Um, Michael is um, um, a researcher from the Institute for Governance and Policy Analysis, and he will be tackling issues of partnership and risk. We also have Professor Andrew Conway. Um, Andrew is the Chief Executive Officer of the Institute of Public Accountants, and he's also a Professor of Accounting at the Shanghai University of Finance and Economics. Um, we will also have a number of um, uh, interventions, um, one by Michelle Grattan, the political editor of The Conversation, and one by Michael Keating, Editor-in-Chief of Inside Canberra. So without any further ado, um, I would like to introduce you to Jamie Briggs, um, our Minister, Assistant Minister for Infrastructure and Regional Development. Jamie. It's, uh, it's great to be here uh, uh, today, and it's great that you could be here on a sitting day. It's always an active day. Uh, sitting days and certainly at the moment. Uh, look, thank you for the opportunity to speak to you uh, today about uh, infrastructure. It is a very important part of uh, this government's agenda and has been since we were elected uh, last year. If you remember back last year, uh, we were elected really for four major reasons, uh, four major tasks we put to the Australian people that we said we would achieve if we were elected in September, and that was that we would stop the boats from arriving uh, we would get rid of unnecessary taxes, uh, we would build the roads of the 21st century, and we would fix the budget. They were the four major tasks that Tony Abbott was elected as Prime Minister uh, and the government was uh, elected to do. Uh, on the last two, which I'll touch upon today, we are getting on with the job. Uh, the fixing and building the roads uh, has been something we've focused on since the beginning, and I'll talk more about that. But fixing the budget is obviously an important part uh, of why we were elected, if not the most important part. And it relates very much to our uh, strategy when it comes to infrastructure as well. Uh, Mark mentioned on, the, on his introduction, he used the word austerity in relation to the budget. Well, it's far from an austerity budget. Uh, in fact, the actual very point of what we're trying to achieve in this budget is to prevent the need in the future from having to put in place measures which hurt those who can least afford uh, to be hurt in our society. We want government to be able to provide services to those who need it uh, and do no more. Uh, that's what we want government to do. And the reality was what we found in September last year uh, was a budget that had unsustainable spending uh, way out into the future. Uh, right at the same time as you had uh, the international economy uh, still buffeted by uh, 
several events. You still had a high, we still have a high Australian, Australian dollar, but worse still, we've got an ageing population, which makes it more difficult uh, as, the, as we move into the years ahead uh, for the sustainability of the budget to be managed. So the task in fixing the budget was, was difficult, uh, but not yet impossible. Uh, and if we keep putting off the major decisions, as we keep uh, balking hard calls in ensuring the sustainability of the budget, there will be austerity budgets in the future. That is the reality. Uh, and that's why we're fighting so hard, and that's why we believe so much in the path that we've put in place. Uh, the decisions we've made in this budget don't have uh, sharp effects that you've seen in places like the UK uh, and in Europe uh, on the population. They don't at all. They are, they are measures which, into the medium and longer term, start to address the sustainability. But unless we start, unless we make these decisions now, it will be the next generation who have to put in place similar budget decisions that what you've seen in the UK and what you've seen in Europe. And that's why we put this budget in place in the first place. Uh, but the second part of the budget, which uh, we are very committed to and very proud of, uh, is the growth strategy in the budget because we want Australia to grow faster. Uh, we want Australians' real incomes to grow quicker. Uh, we want uh, the economic miracle, if you like, that we've achieved in the last 30 years to continue. Uh, and to do that, we need to put in place productivity lifting infrastructure. Uh, and that's why in the budget there was a $50 billion commitment or down payment, investment, if you like, uh, in the inf public infrastructure that Australians need, we believe, to grow our productivity faster. Uh, and we didn't just invest uh, in roads uh, without any economic reform attached. We didn't just hand over blank che checks to state governments and said, go and build whatever you like. We've put in place uh, an infrastructure investment program which very specifically targets those roads uh, and targets the uh, infrastructure across the country which we believe will help drive economic growth. Uh, what we're facing in Australia after the last 10 or 15 years of a heavy construction phase in the mining industry uh, is a downturn uh, in that phase, or a movement, I should say, to a production phase in the mining sector, which means far less contribution to our GDP uh, from the private sector infrastructure investment over the last decade, uh, leaving, in effect, a hole in our GDP in the, next coming, year, in the, in the coming years. Uh, it's a, an issue which, of course, was always likely to hit us um, you, you don't continue to build a mining industry forever. There is a point where it, it comes off and moves into its production phase, but it's coming off sharper than what we'd hoped. Uh, and so the government uh, needs to step in, uh, needs to step in and help fill some of that uh, hole in the GDP in the next couple, uh, couple of years. So our growth strategy was about helping fill that GDP gap, uh, creating jobs uh, over the next two or three years, but also not just throwing good money after bad for projects like Pink Bats and projects that we do, don't have a longer term productivity uplift, actually looking at uh, what evidence based policy we can put in place, uh, if I can use that, steal that term from a fellow speaker today, uh, to ensure we are investing in infrastructure that, that does get our productivity up, uh, our growth rate up, uh, and the amount of people, the amount of Australians in work up as well. So that's what we've been focused on uh, as part of our growth strategy. We've been focused on driving the private sector involvement. Uh, our $50 billion investment will leverage, we believe, with the state governments over the next decade, $126 billion worth of investment in infrastructure. Uh, in the budget, we didn't just hand over money, we, uh, we did so uh, in a, uh, uh, with some reform attached. Uh, for instance, in Sydney with the WestConnex project, the first stage of the West Connects was a project that we committed to in the, in the election campaign with a $1.5 billion grant. The second stage we brought forward by 18 months with a concessional loan. The first time uh, that form of alternative financing has been used by the federal government uh, in our history for a road project. In Perth, we introduced pricing on uh, uh, Perth roads for the first time with the establishment of the Perth Freight Link, uh, which will be a project uh, which will see a dedicated freight corridor where the freight industry pays uh, a price uh, to get their product to market quicker and more effectively. Uh, again, economic reform is part of our uh, investment strategy. And finally, we introduced the asset recycling initiative uh, where we're encouraging state governments to use their assets 
that they own more effectively by recycling the, uh, the, the capital uh, from state-owned assets uh, into new productivity lifting infrastructure. Uh, you've already seen it in New South Wales with the sale of uh, the Newcastle port, for instance, with the money directly linked uh, into new infrastructure investments. And you've seen it across the country. You've seen interest basically from every state government since we've announced it. Even if I can say my good friend, the South Australian Labor Treasurer, Tom Kutzentonis, who uh, has said publicly he wasn't so interested, but interestingly in their budget recently, they announced the sale of a state asset uh, to, use the uh, to try and access the infrastructure investment, uh, the asset recycling fund, I should say. So again, the budget, not just a $50 billion commitment, but a commitment with economic reform, uh, a commitment trying to leverage the private sector's involvement uh, in infrastructure. Uh, when we came to government last year, uh, an element of the infrastructure agenda was something that we had to fix. Uh, the, the selection, uh, the cost and the timeliness of projects uh, was, was far from good enough. Uh, it was far from good enough. Uh, if I can give one bit of credit to the former government, the establishment of Infrastructure Australia uh, was a good decision. Uh, it was a good development in getting better evidence-based uh, decisions made on which projects government should be funding across the country. But the problem with Infrastructure Australia was it was, uh, it was doomed to fail uh, in, the, in the way it was established uh, by the former government. And I mean that by uh, it lacked independence. Uh, it was uh, a body that had an a, uh, infrastructure coordinator appointed directly by the minister. Uh, and in that uh, appointment process, for one reason or another, the states completely lost faith uh, in the infrastructure coordinator and therefore Infrastructure Australia. And so what you saw, at least for the last two years, was the major states, Queensland, Victoria and New South Wales, refusing to cooperate with Infrastructure Australia, which makes it a useless body. Because uh, ultimately, the states deliver these projects. The federal government doesn't deliver infrastructure projects, the states do. Uh, and so the first task of our government was to reform Infrastructure Australia, and we did that through the parliament uh, just a few weeks ago. Uh, we've established a more independent body where you've got an independent board appointed by government who makes decisions on the CEO, who appoints the CEO themselves. We've asked Infrastructure Australia to do an audit uh, of Australia's infrastructure needs uh, and to build a priority list for the next 15 years, to work with the states, to build a publicly available and known priority list with uh, business cost ratios and benefits uh, highlighted so the private sector can look at that list just as they did with the North Connects project with Transurban and New South Wales and say that it might be willing to invest in that project uh, with some government assistance driving more product, uh, productivity investment uh, in our country. Uh, so Infrastructure Australia needed to be reformed, uh, it needed to be changed and we've done that. But one of the other issues that we decided that we needed to, to look at in a more comprehensive way was the broader uh, selection of and choices in respect of uh, infrastructure. How much it was costing and how long it was taking to deliver projects. Uh, and that's why in November last year, we asked the Productivity Commission uh, to do a report uh, into public infrastructure, the cost, the timeliness, timeliness and uh, financing options, uh, to see whether there was more that we could do uh, to reduce the time it was taking, um, to reduce the cost to taxpayers, uh, and to see whether we can leverage private sector investment uh, more often uh, into public infrastructure. Uh, and today, after question time, the Treasurer uh, will uh, table the uh, final report from the Productivity Commission uh, into public infrastructure. Uh, it's a report uh, which we believe from an independent source uh, will give or is giving uh, some very serious advice and some serious advice uh, that we will take uh, and work with the states to implement reform over the coming months. Uh, we believe that there was a need for an independent informed view of what governments can do uh, and can do better in delivering infrastructure, and it was long overdue. Uh, given this, the scale of our infrastructure task and the macroeconomic challenges ahead of us, the government believed it was important that we had this comprehensive review to make sure we are getting the best value for taxpayers' dollars, that we are saying to taxpayers, we're investing your money wisely in the infrastructure that Australia needs, not for just for today, 
but for tomorrow. We asked the Commission to analyse and report on how infrastructure is funded finan and financed in Australia, the rationale, role, uh, objectives of alternative funding and financing, uh, and to provide advice on the ways to improve the decision making and implementation process. What it found uh, was firstly that there was enormous community and industry interest. Uh, there was over 200 submissions, which is a substantial amount for the Productivity Commission. The submissions delivered an overwhelming and consistent message that there was a desperate need for a comprehensive overhaul of the practices currently used in the development and assessment of public infrastructure projects. In fact, the findings of this inquiry show the system that we inherited last September is broken and in desperate need of reform. The Commission has found that a do-nothing approach, in other words, more of the same, will, and I quote, simply increase the cost to users, taxpayers, the community generally, and lead to more wasteful infrastructure. The final report, which we're tabling today, highlights numerous examples of infrastructure projects that were poor value for money, arising from inadequ inadequate project planning and selection. The report particularly singles out uh, the National Broadband Network as the most significant example of of a project, poor value for money, proceeded without a thorough cost-benefit analysis or proper consideration of the best outcome for taxpayers. The focus of the project was how to implement government policy without considering the merits uh, of other options. In the end, the cost of the NBN announced by the Rudd government seven years ago has almost doubled to $70 billion. Yet to highlight the partisan nature of Infrastructure Australia under the previous government, the project was made a priority even without a cost-benefit analysis being required. It's worth remembering this point when our political opponents make exaggerated claims about our infrastructure uh, agenda. The Commission also identified consistent drivers shaping the need for change, including concerns about infrastructure deficiencies holding back productivity growth, concerns about the rising cost of delivering new infrastructure, and potential for efficiency gains uh, or savings. Concerns about debt and long-term budgetary pressures that will hold back the delivery of vital infrastructure and the need to bring forward infrastructure projects to offset uh, decreasing investment and employment in other sectors, particularly mining. The Commission's findings show that no single reform will address the infrastructure challenges facing Australia, but rather comprehensive reforms to projects, finance, selection, governance and planning will be required. The Commission has made a number of recommendations relating to better institutional and governance arrangements, the need for consideration of various public and private financing models as alternatives to traditional models uh, of state or taxpayer, I should say, funding. Road specific institutional and funding reforms, improving planning and tendering arrangements, addressing some of the factors influencing cost, achieving better labour markets, particularly on construction sites, better data collection that has the potential to revolutionise the planning and cost of infrastructure. The PC has identified savings of at least $1 billion per year uh, from undertaking these reforms. The majority of the reforms recommend, recommended by the commi Commission, the Productivity Commission, directly relate to state and territory governments who are responsible for the delivery of public infrastructure, particularly in respect of roads. In the coming months, I'll be leading our discussions with the state and territory governments uh, about the implementations of the Commission's uh, recommendations. They will be critical to achieving real outcomes for the Australian Government uh, and for the Australian people, and we'll respond after those consultations uh, with a final uh, set of actions later this year. While the findings will drive new and important infrastructure reforms for the future, the Commission has ad identified reforms that could be implemented immediately, including some that we are already actioning, including improving project selections, uh, project selection, including sub uh, subjecting election commitments to uh, rigorous project assessment, uh, the Australian Government uh, election commitments are all subject to Australia, Infrastructure Australia's assessment if they're over $100 million in value. Pricing reform, transport ministers have agreed and are working to impl implement initial, uh, initial heavy vehicle investment and access reform measures. Privatisation, where it improves investment and operation efficiency. Already the state assets are being reinvested into critical uh, infrastructure uh, projects. Having a clear idea about pitfall, pitfalls and lessons from different models. And, and in that respect, Infrastructure Australia has already been asked to look and audit uh, what uh, our infrastructure base across the country. Using alternatives to finance 
uh, finance infrastructure such as traffic mo uh, flow management, uh, intelligent use traffic lights, peak hour road closures, ramp metering, uh, and the states are certainly already doing this. And finally, the reintroduction of the Australian Building and Construction Commission to bring back uh, law uh, on building sites across Australia. The Australian government has already begun the job of repairing the broken system we inherited from the former government. The government's vision for infrastructure is one that will deliver jobs, economic growth and set Australia up as a powerhouse in the region. We've embarked on the biggest infrastructure spend in our history, as I said earlier, which we believe will generate with the state governments uh, some $126 billion in investment in public infrastructure over the next decade. Uh, we want to drive productivity. We want to drive jobs growth. Uh, and we want to drive economic growth. That's why we're investing in the east-west project in, uh, in Melbourne. It's why we're investing in the north-south corridor in Adelaide. It's why we're investing in the West Connects project, both stages in Sydney. That's why for the first time in 40 years, a, a government made a decision about a second Sydney airport uh, in the western, western part of Sydney. Uh, and we announced with that a $3.5 billion investment in the road infrastructure supporting uh, those, uh, that, that decision. And that's why we announced the Perth Freight Link uh, in the budget in Perth to drive the economic growth in Western Australia uh, with better infrastructure. Uh, we've, we're putting money into regional areas as well, particularly through our Black Spots program and Roads to Recovery uh, and the National Highways upgrades. Uh, again, we want the value for money for taxpayers by selecting projects appropriately based on evidence. Uh, we are dedicated uh, as a government to ensuring we leave a legacy for uh, the next generation uh, of a better system of infrastructure, uh, that we leave uh, a stronger economy uh, because we've invested in the right, uh, in the right projects uh, at the right time. Of course, as it gets more difficult, uh, as projects get more expensive, uh, it is more important than ever that we engage with the private sector to be part uh, of the uh, infrastructure investment strategy across Australia. The private sector is willing um, if we can get the circumstances uh, right, and we've seen that in the budget, where the government contributes, the private sector is involved, uh, and we're getting better infrastructure. Uh, we will have better infrastructure uh, across, a, across Australia. The Productivity Commission report that we'll table today will be another step uh, in the direction that the government is taking to not only invest heavily, but get the best value for taxpayers uh, while delivering that new infrastructure that we so, uh, we so need to drive our economic growth. Uh, it is a very important part, as Mark said at the beginning uh, of our agenda. The Prime Minister is very focused uh, on delivering uh, on all of our election commitments, but particularly in, in respect of delivering the infrastructure for the 21st century that we need for a stronger economy. Uh, it's terrific you're focusing on this subject today. It's a very important subject. Uh, it's part of the G20 agenda in November. Uh, there's a B20 meeting this Saturday uh, in Sydney where it's also part of that agenda. Uh, it's an issue, an issue which the globe is dealing with, but in particular in Australia we are dealing with it right now in a very proactive way. Uh, and it's great to be here today uh, to talk to you about the Productivity Commission report. The next step uh, in the reforms we believe will ensure that we can build a much stronger Australia. Thanks so much. to speak to the printer about that. Uh, <laughs> yes, yeah, so there's, as you say, the G20's coming up and there's lots of examples of how other countries have dealt with similar infrastructure problems and public transport and, and light rail. What's your view on, on, the, on the tack that other countries have taken in the G20 and uh, do you see a role for public transport and, and light rail... Um, uh, in some of Australia's major cities, or are we just too spread out and, and, and that sort of infrastructure uh, is not possible, um, given the, the wide uh, range of the major Australian cities? Sure. Well, um, 
there are there, there is of course a role for um, public transport, um, uh, and I think impo an important po point that is often missed in this debate about public transport is that 50% uh, of the kilometres travelled public transport kilometres travelled in Australia are by bus. Um, last time I checked, buses use roads. Uh, so if you improve the quality of your road infrastructure, you'll improve the uh, the, the efficiency and the operations of, of the public transport sector. Um, secondly, uh, we made a decision in opposition, and we've stuck with it in government, that we would invest very heavily in our uh, freight networks, particularly our road networks across the country, and freight rail for that matter, and we would leave the states to do their traditional role of uh, building public transport projects such as, as railway lines. Um, there's a lot of commentary and there's a lot of uh, myth that's been developed by uh, dare I call the myth makers in this space who have said that if you do that, you you know you'll you'll have no public transport investment because the states will just will just look for our money and go straight to uh, will go straight to the roads. Well, since the election in September, there's been 25 billion dollars of new public transport projects announced by state governments across the country. Uh, add to that, we believe with the asset recycling initiative that many of the states, uh, Victoria for instance, uh, will use. Um, assets they currently have, uh, uh, sell that off and use the money and the incentive we're paying, the 15% incentive we're paying uh, for investment in uh, productivity lifting uh, uh, infrastructure projects, which will include public transport. So yes, it does have a role. Ultimately, the planning and the, and the decisions about uh, what role it plays in each of the state capitals across the country are matters for the state government. Uh, but I think what you're seeing at the moment is that a new level of co cooperation between Canberra and the state governments when it comes to uh, when it comes to infrastructure. Uh, even the sole remaining state Labor government in South Australia, uh, we came to a, a terrific deal for South Australians in the budget with uh, in, uh, $1.5 billion investment in the upgrade of South Road. In the state budget following subsequent to that, uh, the state government put money into its rail network. So I think what you're seeing is a, a very good cooperation. I think with the reforms to Infrastructure Australia on our priority list, you'll see um, an even better evidence-based decision making when it comes to uh, what governments are funding and, and indeed what the private sector is getting themselves involved in. Well, look, the reality is if you look at a WestConnex project in Sydney, uh, the it's a project which will cost about $12 billion or around about for the three stages. Uh, had the state governments 30 years ago protected the corridor which was there, it would cost far less, but when you go underground it increases the cost enormously to build tunnels. There is no way governments have got the capacity by themselves to build these projects any longer. Uh, you have to fund them somehow and in a sense a form of, of, uh, of uh, pricing has to be part of it. Can you imagine Melbourne today without the CityLink project? Uh, you know, it is, it is always horses for courses and you've got to get the model right. Uh, and some, some cities indeed, uh, the, a toll road as such won't work because they don't have the size and they don't have the, um, the capacity of the economy to drive it. Um, but where it's appropriate, we think um, we need to work in that space to get the new infrastructure delivered. So the private sector will play a massively increased role in public infrastructure in the, in, in the coming years. Michelle. Michelle Graydon from uh, The Conversation. Uh, Mr Briggs, the government faces quite a lot of uh, potential losses in the Senate which will cost uh, a good deal of money. What's the plan B if you do lose a lot of revenue through Senate defeats? Do you let the deficit blow out or are other programs including such as, or at least such as, infrastructure programs trimmed? Well, thank you, Michelle. It's great to see you here. And um, I appreciate the promotion to being treasurer. And uh, I'll um, let Joe know on the way to on question time that he's been uh, put aside. Uh, look, I'll let Joe answer the question about what we'll do in, in respect of uh, what happens in the Senate. But I, I'd make a couple of points. The first is I think we need to be a little patient. Um, You've uh, covered politics for some time, Michelle, and I've been around for a little while. Um, this is not all that unusual in the, in the way that a uh, Senate for, some, for many years, other than the last three years of the Howard government, uh, has been, uh, the balance of power has been held by 
uh, different groups from the government of the day and there's always a task in negotiating and, and at the moment, sure, there's a lot of attention on what's happening but I think we need to be patient uh, and the government will be methodical and continue to work through um, what we believe is the right direction for the country. As I said at the beginning of the remarks, if we don't make these decisions today, we'll be back here next year or the year after that making harder decisions. Uh, and we're going to keep making that argument. Um, we're not going to just fold over in the first week. Uh, I think we will be patient, methodical and work through uh, the Senate as the Australian people would expect us to do. Um, the infrastructure investments, however, are absolutely commitments of the government. Um, we, as I said at the beginning, there are two aspects of the budget. The first is to address the unsustainability, na unsustainable nature of the spending that we all left. But the second is to grow our economy faster. Uh, and this is absolutely a key component in ensuring that we are driving growth, uh, that we are driving job opportunities for, for Australians. Last week, unemployment went to 6%, first time in over a decade. We don't want to see it go higher. We want to bring it back down. We want uh, our economy performing better. Uh, and so the infrastructure agenda is absolutely a uh, rock-solid commitment of the government to ensure that we are getting better, uh, we're getting better value, uh, we're getting better performance, I should say, uh, from the economy. So in the end, we will work through the Senate processes. We'll do it in a methodical fashion. We'll work with all the crossbenchers and we're, we're confident that as we continue to explain why it is that we need to address um, the difficult decisions today and not leave them for tomorrow, we'll get more through uh, and we'll achieve the agenda we're seeking uh, than, what we, than what people may be commentating on today. Mr Briggs, my name is John Burns. I'm just a, a resident, a, a voter who lives in Canberra. And I, I love the thought of um, continued investments in infrastructure. But one thing I'm really dreading is, and I hope you're going to answer this the right way and answer the question in the spirit it's being asked, but <laughs> can you please confirm that there's not going to be any federal money um, directed to the ACT government for this light rail? I can. Excellent. Thank you. Have we got any other... Do you want one more now? I've, uh, that was so short. Is there another question? <laughs> another question over here. All right, no, no, okay, one more. I bored them. Xu uh, Haijing from Xinhua News Agency of China. Uh, Ms. Briggs, uh, do you see any role of foreign investment in, um, in the infrastructure uh, work in the future of, in Australia? And there, there is a report by the University of Sydney about this investment uh -huh. in Australia, and it says there will be, I mean, it foresees a, a bright future for Chinese investment, in particularly in the area of infrastructure, because China is quite, I mean, has the know-how, uh, yep. know-how, because China has, uh, has done a lot of infrastructure work in the, in the past. So do you see any role of Chinese investment in the future uh, in Australia? Thank you. Uh, absolutely. Um, I think uh, this is, no matter how you look at it, a great time to be driving a, an infrastructure investment um, agenda because there is a lot of interest around. There's a lot of domestic interest um, from superannuation firms in Australia, which for many years has been commentary about why don't why haven't Australian superannuation firms been investing more heavily, particularly in greenfield developments in infrastructure? Um, but I think that the fact you've got a lot of interest from international investors um, right now uh, is one of the reasons you're, you're starting to see a, a, a real drive for competition. And y all you have to do is talk to Duncan Gay, my counterpart in New South Wales, or uh, Michael O'Brien in Victoria, and they'll tell you that the interest in uh, the processes they've got on in respect of the east-west project in Victoria and the West Connects project in Sydney uh, is out of the ballpark. Uh, they're very excited about the amount of interest, the amount of domestic and foreign uh, interest in being part of those projects. So I absolutely see uh, a role. In fact, this sat Saturday uh, I'm speaking at a, uh, a, a round table as part of the B20 with a whole bunch of uh, people from across the globe, uh, investors from across the globe on exactly that, encouraging them to be interested. And can I say, I think it would be terrific if Australian companies were investing in uh, Chinese infrastructure as well. And I just hope that later this year, Andrew Robb, who I suspect has been our best performing minister so far, 
is able to sign off on the Chinese free trade agreement because that would add just another leg, just another huge step uh, in the opportunities for both countries with, with two-way investment uh, to achieve the growth that we need for future generations. Thank you. Okay, so we'll be um, taking a few um, short commentaries um, in relation to infrastructural questions um, in Australia. So, so to begin, I, I agree that the, the budget was informed by the need to think long term. Um, and I would like to begin by applauding the Minister for taking a long term view on infrastructure, um, even in a period that I think the perception out there is that it is an austerity um, period. Um, and that might have been created by political rhetoric, uh, but unfortunately, perception is everything in politics, and the perception out there is that we are experiencing uncertain and, and difficult times. Um, but that means, in my view, that, uh, that thinking long-term becomes more and more important. Uh, the impact of economic downturn since 2007 to 8 on Western industrialized countries has encouraged recovery strategies that involve some mixture of austerity over public finances and investment in new growth opportunities such as in infrastructure. And we appear now to be following the trend um, somewhat belatedly here in Australia. However, and I think this is the key point, there is some doubt whether the long-term policy-making and governing staying power needed to underwrite such strategies is possible given the democratic myopia inevitably created by pressures of the electoral cycle. And this is obviously more acute in Australia given the three-year electoral cycle and also the dummy whammy of the gatekeeping role of the independents in the Senate. So, a capacity for long-term politics is not easy to achieve in any circumstances in democratic politics. And it's arguably become more harder to muster. The boom years of 1990 to 2007, in which the old growth model dominated, has left many established democracies with legacies that will be difficult to overcome, as the minister um, suggested. And this is not only in terms of economic or financial problems, but also in terms of the certain model of politics on offer. Short term in focus, consumerist in style, and neoliberal in ideology, which seems ill-fitted to the task of taking a new economic path. There are even some that go further and argue that short termism is inherent to democratic politics. And their prescription appears to be that the only hope for long-term policy processes to emerge is to take issues away from democratic politics and hand them over to special purpose bodies, such as commissions of audits or Infrastructure Australia. And I'm sorry, but I'm not sure whether this will work in the long term. The key question then becomes, can democratic politics deliver long-termism? Can democratic politics confront tough choices? Can it legitimate short-term sacrifices for long-term gain? Can it take on and defeat powerful and vested interests? I think it can, but only if a new politics is on offer. A politics that seeks to establish common ownership of the major public policy problems that we are confronting, such as infrastructure. A new politics that thinks long-term and engages citizens directly in the fundamentals of reform thinking. Now, the white paper on the reform of the Federation that came out a week or so ago um, does provide some interesting ideas from this perspective. It identifies the appetite for reform amongst Australians and hints at some potential democratic innovations that could be bent to the purposes of long-termism. For example, it refers to the notion of subsidiarity. So the idea, basically, that we should devolve decision-making as close as possible to the people. Um, and this has been used to build long-term thinking across the austerity economies of 
Europe, where, for example, because of cuts of up to 40%, local governments have said, well, look, we can't affect these cuts. We need to ask our citizens what they prioritize. Um, increasingly, the role of um, local communities in priority setting is a key feature of subsidiarity. And so should be the case with investment in large-scale infrastructural projects. There's also, of course, um, reference to referendum. The argument that following considered deliberation on major once-in-a-generation public policy decisions, those decisions should then be put to public referenda to gain broader legitimacy from Australian citizens. We also see as well the creeping need for the development of a regionalization approach to infrastructure. And again, the idea here is that shouldn't it be the people themselves that specify their priorities for investment in, in infrastructure across the regions of Australia? Um, so again, um, within the, the white paper, there's reference to an increasing regionalization um, crystallized around a devolution project. But in my view, this would need to be underpinned by a strong citizen-centric approach. What is certain is that the critical challenges confronting the minister and his colleagues in a complex world can no longer be managed through hard power, command and control politics. It's quite clear from the opinion poll survey of the um, data of the last three years that Australian citizens are tired with the old politics on offer. This is an era where the use of soft power or the power to persuade in partnership with the citizenry has become the only alternative. So that is my little commentary, first of all, on the, the politics of, of infrastructure. I'd now like to invite um, Dr. Michael Jensen uh, to come up and say some words as well on the Thank you very much, Mark. In 2008, uh, during the United States presidential election, much was made of a bridge to nowhere in Alaska, which would have connected the Alaskan mainland with the sparsely populated Gravina Island. Upon further reflection, they ultimately decided to not build the bridge because it would have cost hundreds of millions of dollars and produced very little benefit to the Alaskan people. But at the same time, the Alaskan congressional delegation bagged an enormous political victory and managed to secure federal highway funds to build an extensive roadway network on the island, which remains little used today. This example highlights a couple themes which I would like to uh, draw out with regards to infrastructure project development. The first concerns a topic that was mentioned several times by Mr. Briggs, the idea of evidence-based policymaking. There's a consistent concern regarding the politicization of policymaking, such that infrastructure projects are built on the basis of what would score the most political points for particular constituencies, be they uh, motorists who are interested in seeing more roads built, or various other environmental groups, or people living in large, city, densely populated cities that would like to see more public transportation. Neither one of these ideas is inherently right or wrong, but depend upon the particular evidence that can be marshaled in support of one policy decision or another. And inevitably, certain trade-offs have to be made. And the government is tasked with trying to decide which priorities they'll fulfill through the, the use of the public funds. When I say policy decisions should be evidence-based, I don't simply mean that information should be marshaled in support of a particular favored policy. We live in an age where increasingly lots of information circulates, and the introduction of a particular report supporting a policy decision, such as the creation of light rail, immediately is responded to with countervailing information produced by a network of other policy interests against that idea. That's not what I mean by information-based policymaking and evidence-based policymaking. What I mean is an argument that is marshaled in support of a policy or against it based on the terms, the technical terms of discourse 
concerning that particular area that do not necessarily appeal directly to a particular constituency, but to an elaboration of a public need that's informed with, through consultation and involvement of various stakeholders, including, and most importantly, citizen end users that would be otherwise involved in those projects. Although the decisions need to be made by, government, uh, by governments, they need not fall, the responsibility need not fall squarely on the shoulders of the ministers in government, as the informational needs in managing risk and addressing uh, the ever complex development issues require significant input from the public service, various end users, and the private partners who are increasingly necessary to identify the priorities and meet future needs and the competencies necessary to realize a policy vision. The second theme I'd like to mention concerns the need for policy coordination. Treasurer Hockey recently stressed the need for greater macroeconomic coordination between the various members of the G20. The same idea in general terms applies at the domestic level. Even in the absence of a politics before policy infrastructure decision, the lack of a system level approach to infrastructure decisions linking infrastructure decisions today with the path dependencies they give rise to and changes in pattern development, uh, patterns of development, migration, and adjacent policy sectors necessarily gives rise to the need for these different groups to talk to each other and to have interactions not only between ministers but between ministers and various departments and between the departments themselves and the various other end users within the society who would make use of these uh, infrastructure developments and would also reduce the risk then to private uh, public partnerships. Achieving uh, that kind of vision though requires a higher level coordination and buy-in from those people ultimately on the end user side to be successful. And achieving that uh, with the, the public sector can increase government capacities, distribute li risks, and in the course of, uh, uh, of public matters whose buy-in is required to manage those risks, ultimately make policy successful. And as uh, society is becoming increasingly complex, policy requires more flexible government responses so that they can build a bridge to the future rather than a bridge to nowhere. Thank you, Michael. Um, can I now invite uh, Professor Andrew Conway uh, to address the forum? Um, Andrew is the Chief Executive Officer of the Institute of Public Accountants um, at Shanghai University of Finance and Economics. Andrew is a Professor of Accounting. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, Thanks very much for the opportunity to speak today. In the brief time available, I want to just uh, reflect on the infrastructure planning in the context of small business. Um, and I'll offer my remarks in the context specifically in relation to productivity. And many speakers today have talked about the mechanics of infrastructure funding and programs. Uh, and the, the minister spoke about the infrastructure program and the funding the government's put in, which indeed is, is uh, sizable and encouraging. But I wanted to reflect on what I believe to be the most important factor facing small business productivity, uh, and that is uh, digital uh, access and, importantly, small business connectivity. So if I was presenting to a group, there are other academics uh, obviously here today, if I was presenting to a group of students, you'd try and start with some great theorists in this space. And in relation to the digital economy, where better to start than um, Mark Zuckerberg, the CEO and founder of Facebook. Um, Zuckerberg recently wrote that uh, access to the internet has had a profound impact on civilization as we know it. Yet uh, recent estimates put the global uh, population's access to uh, the internet at around 2.7 billion people. Interestingly, Australia's population has access, so the internet penetration is at around 83, 84% as reported in the Wall Street Journal. While uh, interestingly, Iceland tops the league table at almost 97%. The internet has had arguably a faster and greater impact on global, uh, uh, the global ec economic conditions than perhaps any other sector. A 2011 McKinsey report suggests that the internet already accounts for a greater impact on the economy and share of economic activity in many developed economies than agricultural uh, or, uh, or energy. So what really could be achieved if we encourage a greater level of internet connectivity? A Deloitte Access and, uh, and Optus report suggests that in Australia, just 35% of SMEs make use of the internet in their day-to-day -day business. 
So from an infrastructure perspective, it doesn't necessarily just mean, of course, the hard infrastructure. As Zuckerberg notes, nearly 90% of the globe's population live within a uh, range of a cellular network. So we generally have universal access to emergency telecommunications uh, that really is available from anywhere in the world. The challenge really is connecting. China's largest ICT company, Tencent, uh, has a dedicated program of offline to online to encourage their users and businesses that they partner with to become uh, involved in the online community. So it's clear that what can be achieved when businesses are connected. You know, stable and secure payment system frees up cash flow, which enhances the transparency and builds up the confidence of business owners to grow and obviously to employ. Um, and it's no secret, of course, that Australia already suffers from the tyranny of distance and physical transfer of goods and components to and from ports is plagued by one immovable continuum, being time. Time, of course, is a global commodity that does not have uh, uh, that does not fluctuate. In fact, it's perhaps the only resource that we have and have access to that we have literally no control over it in terms of whether we can stop it, slow it or hasten it. So we must be smarter, faster and produce at a lower cost. Sounds simple, but much more difficult to achieve. But it speaks to the very heart of productivity. When I open my uh, brief remarks, I talked about productivity being the focus of, of these, uh, these remarks. Of course, the issue for Australia is that Australia's multi-factor productivity has been in decline over the last decade. And according to the ABS, our multi-factor productivity fell by 1.3% in 2013, which follows a similar fall in 2012. So when we talk of productivity, we're obviously talking uh, about the way we combine our resources to produce goods and services. It's now taking us longer to produce goods and services uh, than, uh, and it's become more expensive to source those inputs to service, uh, uh, to service our, our, our needs. And perhaps the third whammy to local business has been the emergence of competitive goods and services from offshore. But of course we must accept that we operate in a global marketplace. Uh, we must be boosting the resilience and productive capacity of Australia's small businesses for one very good reason. And the very livelihood and prosperity that Australia has enjoyed over the last 20 years is actually at risk of becoming a thing of the past. We've all enjoyed growth in the national incomes of over 2 and 2.5% two and for some time largely been buffered by a healthy terms of trade, uh, but the projections from Treasury point to a looming crisis, a crisis of national income driven by a pro productivity crisis. The economy has already transitioned. Our reliance on terms of trade to boost our productivity is set to decrease in the next decade. So if we are to continue to enjoy our increased prosperity, we need to lift labour force productivity to over 3%. This has never been achieved in Australia's history. One of the critical ways to, of course, boost national productivity is to boost the growth in the SME sector. In China, they're referred to as micro and small entities, MSEs. But it's absolutely critical for us to achieve. And picking up a point that uh, both Dr Jensen and Professor Evans were talking about, this isn't just the role of government to try and change the dialogue. Uh, and it's not just up to government to lead, certainly to facilitate, but not necessarily, it's not necessarily to lead. So the IPA, the Institute of Public Accountants, has taken up that challenge. We've commenced the process of a discussion to form an Australian small business white paper. And it is an Australian first to have a dedicated white paper developed by industry, linking small business owners, their advisors, regulators and, and academics to provide direct policy input. We held the first small business white paper summit here at Parliament House just a couple of weeks ago. And, uh, and we're about to embark on a national roadshow of that summit around the regions of Australia to again picking up a theme by previous speakers to uh, have the people that it affects shaping the agenda, speaking directly with small business owners and operators around the regions of Australia to have a direct policy input into the future of small business policy in Australia. That process has identified six key policy areas and of course uh, our white paper is on, the draft white paper is on our website for review. So from an infrastructure point of view, there is a heavy focus in the white paper on the digital infrastructure. Offline to online, payment systems that focus on secure and prompt payment, boosting knowledge and practices in the use of technology, and the possibility of incorporating incentives through the taxation system uh, to innovative initiatives to boost the willingness and open the door to new businesses in new markets with access to new technologies. The broad challenge in summary is that the white paper uh, will, uh, has, uh, the, the white paper process has is to help directly shape the small business policy landscape in Australia uh, to turn Australia into genuinely one of the best places in the world to start and run a small business. Thanks very much.
Thank you, thank you, Andrew. Um, so if I can invite our, our speakers just to, uh, maybe to come up to this table. Um, the idea now is to, to Uh, Mike Keating again. Uh, I was uh, wondering, as you said, uh, infrastructure is not just about uh, roads, rail, freight. It's also um, the internet and, uh, and those sort of services. I was speaking to the member for Indi who was here earlier and uh, obviously uh, internet and the NBN is, is key in her electorate. Uh, how do you see uh, the rollout of Australia having a good internet service and, and re reliable telecommunications? Is it simply too large a company, uh, sorry, a country for, for that, for all Australians to have high speed internet given the costs associated with the NBN and the, and the problems? Um, and what would you see as the solution? Thanks for such an easy question. I'm just joking, of course. The, look, the, the, the issues around Australian business having access to the internet, which is in essence your question, the broader issue around the NBN and its rollout, I think the Minister's spoken to that as an issue. The government has its own approach on that. Um, the challenges I was trying to make in my remarks is about how do we get more businesses online uh, faster? Um, the economic impact of a business being connected is pretty profound. I think the ABS last month reported uh, sales um, uh, specifically in relation to small business of around $290 billion uh, online. And that's, by, you know, it's a large number, but by global standards it's fairly low. Um, the fact that 19% uh, of small businesses in Australia actually have a digital business strategy. 55% of them uh, are involved in some form of social media or even have a web presence. So I think it speaks not just to the mechanics of the infrastructure, but the planning infrastructure that's behind it, encouraging businesses to become far more active um, uh, online. Uh, so my view in, in relation to the, the broader issue of the NBN uh, connectivity is about how does government assist and facilitate the planning of a small business to ensure it actually has the, the necessary architecture sitting behind it. Um, you know, from large and small uh, SMEs, there are, they range from, of course, micro entities of sole, uh, sole practitioners right through to uh, 20 or more employees, in some cases 100, depending on the definition you use. Um, yeah, how do we encourage those people to have a digital business strategy? It sounds like, a, in some cases, a foreign concept to a small business to actually, to actually have. So I, I think it goes to the heart of what government can do to encourage that discussion between, in our case, as the accountants providing advice to businesses and small businesses, um, what can we do to encourage small businesses to be thinking about this? And in doing so, how do they take their goods and services uh, offshore? It, it will open up markets. We've seen, the, as the economic studies point to the growth opportunities in small businesses becoming faster and smarter with the way they move their goods and services around. Um, so I think it's not just the infrastructural components of the networks and the access to it. I personally don't believe it's necessarily just an issue about hard wire and hard cable. I think the issue is around uh, how you access uh, wireless technology and, and leverage that as well. So it's a very, a very big question. And I think those elements of business planning, access to wi uh, wireless technology, and also the way in which you incorporate the trusted advice uh, component is absolutely critical. Yeah, yeah, Mark, uh, this is directed at you. Um, I was down in the Kunawara over the weekend uh, talking to a group of farmers and it struck me after the conversation that the Australian economy is now starting to mimic Europe in a number of ways. The farmers were saying they were being strangled by national laws and the one they've got two grievances. One's the national safety law, the other one's the national transport safety law. The first one says that a farmer can't climb a windmill anymore and fix it unless he's got a height certificate. He can't fix his own header 
unless he's got a mechanical engineering certificate. He can't actually work in his own drains unless he's got a TAFE certificate. So all the things that farmers used to do on their properties, they're no longer allowed to do. And the out-of-work forestry workers from the CFMEU are now safety inspectors and are determined to police this with a vengeance. The second thing is even if they get a crop in, which in the Coonawarra at the moment they've got sensational crops, they can't get them to market in Melbourne because of Anthony Albanese's road transport safety laws which, make, which add about 50% more to the price of their products when they hit the port in Melbourne. So they basically say it's unprofitable to farm in what was previously the food bowl of Australia. Now, allowing them regional control won't do them any good. They can fix up the infrastructure under a a regional approach, but the national laws are killing them. How do you resolve the tension? I mean, it looks as if it's like the European Commission closing down small business in Europe. Uh, yes, that was definitely uh, um, viewed as a European disease for, for a long period of time. Um, but I have to say over the last um, five to 10 years, as you probably have seen, there's been a huge backlash against um, creeping Europeanization, particularly in terms of the administrative burden. Um, and um, even um, Germany has led what they call the red tape crusade uh, to try and um, to relieve this, this burden. So, um, yes, I think absolutely um, the administrative burden is, you know, the enemy comp to competitiveness. Um, and I don't think that... Uh, you necessarily need a national policy um, for um, politicians to to win the war of ideas on on, on that one. Most people would recognise that um, that the greater the overhead placed on the business, um, the less they have money to to reinvest and to focus on on productivity. Um, so I think you know I, I would call in general that a, a, a key a key part of this agenda has to be about um, relieving the administrative burden. And bearing in mind as well that industries have been created around the administrative burden. And we have to, we have to recognize that um, there are vested interests at play here. Um, but fundamentally, if we want a competitive Australia, um, we need to have um, a sensible approach to, to governance. Um, and unfortunately, the approach is not sensible at the moment. Hi there. Alicia Doherty from the Australian American Association. And this is just an observation. Um, the US, and I have lived in Australia for 20 years. I am, I am um, a dual citizen, so I love Australia. Um, like the, our Chinese friends, the US, we know how to do roads and infrastructure. We have a lot of them. And we have some really great signage. A lot of um, comments by our diplomatic community are that signage is lacking. Are there any plans to improve that? I must admit, I'm not an expert on signage <laughs> issues. <laughs> um, I'm not sure. Is there anybody here <laughs> in the forum who can, who can comment on, on, on signage issues? also sort of created a body called Destinations New South Wales, which is a tourism body that's looking at all those kind of things. Um, an airport, Sydney Airport, for example, is very focused on making sure signage is, is, is well structured so people know where they're going and where they can go to around the country in a tourism sense as well. So that might answer some questions. Other questions?
observations? Okay then. Uh, well, thank you very much for your uh, participation in, in, to, uh, in this lunchtime's um, uh, session on infrastructure in Australia. Um, no doubt these issues will be um, continue to be heavily debated over the next um, period, particularly um, as the government's policy becomes um, more more focused. Um, so, um, thank you very much to. Um, the Honourable Jamie Briggs for his um, address this lunchtime, um, to Michael J Jensen and to Andrew Conway um, for their contributions, um, and also to Michael Keating and Michelle Grattan and Roger Hausman from um, Inside Canberra. Thank you. <laughs>